So when studying Civil War cavalry tactics, one soon realizes that one must perfect each drill of the previous levels of instruction before graduating the school of the regiment. Exactly what are the differences and why is the school of the regiment so much different than the school of the platoon or even the school of the squadron? This week on the 11th OVC, an introductory look at Poinsett's school of the regiment. Welcome again to another week of the 11th OVC. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, this week, we're going to be diving into the School of the Regiment and uh, actually introducing the School of the Regiment, exactly how Poinsettes introduces the School of the Regiment. Uh, for me, as a student of tactical history, I always enjoy learning the nuances of the drill manuals and then realizing I have to learn them again because I misunderstood the drill manual. For me, Poinsettes School of the Regiment has been the hardest for me to fully grasp and get a picture of exactly what is going on. For one reason, having the entire regiment of 500 or so mounted troopers is almost impossible these days. Due to this lack of numbers, rarely do living historians get to practice and become proficient at regimental drill. And since sticking with the elementary principles of drill of the school of the platoon, or even the school of the squadron is easier, that is generally what you see on the battlefield during reenactments. So in order to understand the school of the regiment, you must first be extremely familiar with all the other successive drills that purposely came before the school of the regiment. Uh, additionally, just like starting out with the school of the trooper dismounted, all the evolutions of the school of the regiment depend on four principal skills. The first principal skills outlined in the school of the regiment, in addition to other manuals uh, of the uh, Poinsett's manual, is that number one, you must be able to learn to pass from the formation of a line to the formation of a column. Then you must learn how to march in column. Then you must ha learn how to pass from formation of a column to the formation of line. And then finally, you must be able to march in a formation of a line, line of battle, or whatever you will. So if you read in point sets, it actually introduces the, these four concepts uh, by dividing them into different evolutions, if you will. Point sets break these four core skills into a total of 12 different evolutions. The first evolution belongs to the first principle, which is passing from line into column. The second evolution develops the skills needed to march in column. And the third through the seventh evolutions identified in the school of the regiment uh, perfect the regiment's ability to basically pass from column into line, which is critical, uh, as the uh, famous movie uh, Gods and Generals says, you must be able to uh, pass from column into line and line back into column, uh, but the ability to go from column into line is very important. Uh, and the 8th through the 12th evolutions develop the skills needed to march in line as an entire regiment. We will discuss the details of each of these evolutions uh, in more detail in different episodes, but we want to kind of set the foundation and introduce the School of the Regiment as Poinsettes does with this. So one of the first things you'll notice about the School of the Regiment versus the other schools that came before this is that the School of the Regiment also really perfects the separation, if you will, if you want to call that, of the general orders versus the commands that execute those orders. For instance, in drill number 772, which is the formation and then the alignment of the entire regiment, the colonel is supposed to command attention by squadron, right? Dress. So then at the second command, repeated by the field officers, again, orders are repeated in the school of the regiment by the field officers, the captain commanding the first squadron commands, squadron, forward, guide right, march. So once the squadron arrives in the line of the file closures of the previous squadron, the captain commands, squadron, halt. The squadron halts and the principal guide of the left immediately posts himself at the point where the left of the squadron is to rest, facing to the right, and the officers of the particular guides continue to march and align themselves immediately. The captain moves to the left flank and commands, right, dress. So at this command, the men all move on together to the alignment, the squadron being aligned, the captain, again, the captain commands, front. Each captain commanding each of their own successive squadrons executes in succession the same movement of the previous squadron and does not command to, their squadron to march on until the squadron and the captain who precedes them has commanded a halt in front of them. The regiment finally being aligned, the colonel commands front to the entire regiment. 
So the point I wanted to bring out in that specific example of a, a drill or something that the regiment would, would practice of, of alignment and, and dressing as a regiment is that there are specific orders that the captain and the field officers and of course the, the colonel of the regiment has to do uh, independent of each other. That is something different you see in the school of the squadron and the school of the platoon where basically the commanders of the platoon or the squadron basically give and execute the commands. Whereas with the school of the regiment, the colonel basically tells the, uh, the squadrons what to do, and the actual captains and the successive field officers uh, execute those by actually saying the commands. So combine the separation of the general orders versus the execution of the orders uh, between the colonel and, and the field officers. Uh, one of the biggest differences with the school of the regiment is that much focus is placed and much responsibility is given to the adjutant, the sergeant major, and again, the other field officers. Much of the specific responsibility given to these ranks are based on posting points of guidance, lines of direction, and to serve as markers for the rest of the regiment to align themselves to. Much focus is given to the general guide and the principal guide of the regiment. So if you're like me and reading point sets from drill number one all the way through the school of the squadron, school of the platoon going back there to school of the regiment, is I got confused that we were supposed to dress right but then also guide left. Uh, and I always were, got confused on the, on the guides. So to review what is meant by the guides and by these terms, article 9th in the first volume of point sets specifies the following. The general guides, the principal guides, and the particular guides are the three definitions that you need to get in your head to understand as the point sets manual goes through certain drills, they very briefly, very quickly talk about general guides need to do this, principal guides need to do that, and the particular guides need to do this. Uh, and so based on that, you need to have a quick understanding of what these definitions are. So to review, general guides, again, general guides, are the two sergeants who, in formation of a regiment, mark the points where the right and the left are to rest. They mark the right and the left. They are selected in the first and last squadrons and are under the specific order of the adjutant and the sergeant major for the tracing of the lines. Now, principal guides are the sergeants who serve to mark the intermediate points in the formation of the line. The sergeants, file closers of the first and fourth platoons, are the principal guides of their respective squadron. So again, the principal guides are intermediate along the front of the, or not the front, but along the line of the regiment, and they serve as, again, additional guides intermittent between the general guides. Now lastly, the third definition that we need to know is the particular guides. Uh, particular guides are the sergeants who place themselves on the line of formation to mark the front of their squadron as they arrive. Uh, the two sergeants of the flanks who are not counted of the rank are the particular guides of their respective squadrons. So again, this goes back to the school of the regiment adds so many skills together all in one maneuver that you really need to know the school of the platoon, the school of the squadron, before you go to the school of the regiment because the sergeants, the, uh, the adjutants, and of course the sergeant major have very specific definitions and very specific roles that they need to fill when maneuvering on the battlefield as a complete regiment. So one thing point sets goes on to introduce uh, in some of these drills in the school of the regiment, the earlier drills of the school of the regiment, specifically in drill number 765, is that they specify that their two orders are very distinct and do not need repeating. Uh, their orders attention and front are not repeated by anyone. However, the preparatory commands are immediately repeated by the field officers. And again, that's specific to the field officers. When it comes to repeating orders, it should come from the top down and only repeated by the field officers. So now point sets continues on with another specification in the school of the regiment. They say that the guide being on the left when the column is right in front, and of course the guide being on the right when the column is left in front, the colonel does not announce the guide, which is interesting because all through volume one, the school of the trooper dismounted, all the way through the school of the squadron, generally the guide is announced. For instance, forward by twos, 
March, guide right. Uh, for, however, specifically for the school of the regiment, the colonel does not announce the guide. He may, however, and the point says specifies this, he may, however, remind them of it when he thinks it proper, uh, but only while the column is marching, not when they are standing still. The indication of the guide is repeated by the field officers and the captains commanding their squadrons. When a line or column is to move at the same time, by the same movement, the captains commanding immediately repeat their preparatory commands. But however, in the case of successive movements, they repeat the preparatory commands sufficiently soon to give that of the execution of the movement only when the movement commences their specific squadron. So again, when it comes to repeating orders, all the captains repeat the orders, uh, repeat the preparatory command if they go in a line together, but if it's going to be uh, successive or if it's going to be like an, an echelon style uh, movement, then the captains command their squadrons, they, they, they don't repeat the preparatory commands until their specific squadron is ready to go. One thing interesting that point sets also specifies is that if an evolution requires a particular movement of some specific squadron, the captain commands this movement instead of repeating the preparatory command given by the colonel. So let me say that again. If an evolution requires a particular movement of a specific squadron, the captain of his squadron commands the movement instead of repeating any preparatory command given by the colonel. The commands of execution are repeated simultaneously again by the field officers, and they are repeated in the same manner by the captains commanding, except in the movements which require their successive commands. So again, point sets is going on to basically repeat itself by saying the field officers repeat the execution commands, uh, and again, they're repeated in the they're repeated by the captains only when the captains commanding their squadrons are ready to move their squadron out in successive or in, in echelon style movement. Meaning when you're in a formation of a regiment and you have other successive squadrons going in front of you and your captain is not saying anything, that's okay. He's waiting for his time to give you the preparatory and execution commands when the time is right for your specific squadron. So one thing that's interesting about calling out the guide is that we just talked about the colonel of the regiment not giving the guide how, unless he feels it should be said. Uh, however, uh, point sets goes on to say that captains commanding always announce the guide, conforming to what is prescribed in the school of the squadron. If it should happen that the command is not heard, each captain commanding conforms as promptly as possible to the movements of the squadron which precedes him in the direction of the formation for breaking. Uh, basically what that's saying is what Point Sets is saying is, again, guides are always called, not by the colonel per se, but at least by the captains commanding their squadrons. Uh, and when it's called, or let's say if a captain does not hear anything, as very common is very often the case. Uh, orders are not heard. I mean, I know my uh, commander said something. I know the, the colonel said something, but I can't quite make out what the orders were. Uh, basically, what point sets is saying here in modern you know, modern language is that if the, if the captain of his squadron is caught off guard and doesn't really know what the order is, doesn't know what to do, he basically fakes it till he makes it. Uh, he just goes along with the flow until he figures out what the order is by context clues, which I find is interesting interesting that Poinsett's goes on to specify this specific aspect. So after Poinsett's school, the regiment specifies all this, they continue to kind of repeat themselves by, specify, by specifying again uh, what to do in successive alignment. For instance, it says, the captain's commanding, after having commanded front, remain at the point which they went to align their squadron, and they stay there until the colonel commands front. And after the colonel commands front, then the captains take their respective positions where they need to be, uh, as specified in the first volume of point sets, again, after the colonel commands front. So when aligning an entire regiment, uh, when, when, the, you know, when the line comes up or when squadrons come up successively to, to align themselves based off the first squadron, uh, each, each captain of their squadron stays there, aligning, stays at the flank, aligning their squadron uh, until the colonel yells front. Front. And after front, again, repeating myself, then that is when the captains take the actual position they need to take of their squadron.
So one thing I also find is interesting in the third volume of Poinsett's School of the Regiment is that it specifies that in evolutions, the movements are made by platoons whenever possible. So any movement made by fours are used only to regain an interval or a distance which is lost or if you have to move or basically if something gets in the way and something completely thwarts your formation, then fine, go to fours and, and regroup real quick. But one thing that Poinsett's is very clear to say is that when you're moving as a regiment, you should move in fronts, if you can, if the room suggests, uh, room in fronts of, of platoons because you want to have a, the largest front possible. The larger your front when you're marching, the quicker it is for your regiment to get in the line of battle at that moment. Um, if you're strung out by fours, if you have 500 troopers strung out by fours to go front in line or even on right into line, uh, that back that back squadron is going to be hoofing it to try to get in line uh, in time. And so that's why whether, and this is with anything, if you are out there in the field and you're marching by squadron, by platoon, by regiment of course here, uh, they you want to be as large of a front as possible. Uh, you don't want to go by twos, you don't want to go by fours. If you you can go and march in column by platoon or even by squadron if the field allows, then that is the position you want to take. So one thing that's important for the colonel to do is that he must make known the points of direction which he thinks proper to give the line. Uh, the adjutant and the sergeant major are charged with posting the general guides, again remember the definition of general guides, and with placing the principal guides successively on the points which have been previously determined. And when they have not been determined, when establishing these, the uh, guides basically point them out. And when they have not been determined, the guides basically guess what the colonel is thinking and point out the line of formation themselves. So this is exactly what we were talking about earlier as far as the school of the regiment really goes on to specify that the adjutant and the sergeant major are really tasked with making sure the, the lines of march and the, the tracing out the lines of where they're going to go are actually set out before as outlined by the colonel or by themselves. Uh, when the colonel wishes the regiment to march either in line or in column, he must give the point point uh, to which the line or the column is to be directed. Again, this must be done by the, the colonel. Uh, the adjutant and the sergeant major for the march in line pointed out to the particular guide of the right or the left of the squadron. So they do this by making it known to the guides of the left and the right. They cause the intermediate points to be taken to ensure organization of the march. So this is all in the introductory side of uh, Poinsett School of the Regiment, and it really dives into the sergeant major and the adjutant and of course working with the colonel to identify those lines of march and the point of direction to where where the uh, regiment is supposed to go. So again, Poinsett's goes on to repeat itself that the, if the colonel has not given the direction of a column, the adjutant and the sergeant major at the preparatory command, so when the, when the colonel gives the preparatory command of, of basically, uh, you know, you know you're going to march, uh, the sergeant major and the adjutant basically guess, point out the guide, uh, or they point out the line of march to the guides on the right and the left, uh, and tell everyone where to go. So as a colonel, it's important to, again, identify the line of march, whether you're in column or whether you're in a line of battle, it's important to identify that march. And sergeant majors and adjutants, your role is to basically cover for the colonel that if he doesn't uh, point out the line of march, or if it's not obvious and the colonel thinks it's obvious, you're basically supposed to kind of second guess what the colonel's doing, point it out to the guides that you're next to, and make sure the regiment Again, you're kind of the second line of defense to make sure the regiment knows what to do as the colonel uh, gives you your command of execution. So after specifying that, Poinsett's introduction to the school of the regiment continues on when saying that from some extraordinary circumstance, again, this is interesting verbiage, guys, I want you to understand this, is that uh, Poinsett says that from some extraordinary circumstance, the squadrons are reduced below their complement of 48 files, the platoons of the same squadrons are equalized among themselves, again, being spread out to around, you know, 11 or 10 or 9 or so files, but never low than eight files. Now it's interesting to note that uh, on it'd be extraordinary circumstances if your squadron 
was less than 48 files. And so if you again, remember the verbiage uh, and the terminology, squadron in the, in the cavalry lang language is similar to like a, a company. Uh, there's five squadrons per regiment, and out of those five squadrons, a squadron is made up of 48 files. Of course, being point says, having a two-rank system, 48 files, let's round that to 50. Uh, one squadron has about 100 troopers in that squadron. But if those extraordinary situations happen, meaning the platoon itself is reduced to nine or even lower eight or seven files, they must modify their size and conform to what is prescribed for sections. Now sections are previously talked about and defined in the, in the first title, the second article, which states the following. When the squadron is to be exercised, it is composed habitually of 48 files. Consequently, each division is composed of 24 files and each platoon of 12 files. If the squadron is increased to 64 files, the platoon is divided into two sections. That on right is the first and of course the left is the second. So then they go on to define the sections in that first title. Uh, by saying if the squadron is so big that you divide into sections, but here in the school of the regiment points out to saying if you're so small, if your platoon is so small, to have less than eight files, then you divide up into sections versus your, your normal platoons. Uh, so again, it goes back to uh, terminology, to verbiage. If your platoon has less than nine files, less than eight files, you basically call it a section versus a platoon. So again, point sets and the introduction of the school of the regiment goes on to say uh, that a squadron may in the same manner be reduced to two or three platoons. Uh, when the number of platoons is reduced in a squadron, the officers who have no platoon command, again, generally lieutenants, become file closers, okay? The sergeants and the corporals are always divided evenly between the ranks after the principles of a complete formation as outlined in the first volume of point sets. So with all that point, Seth then goes on to uh, continue the introduction, uh, talking about drill number 766 that actually kind of defines the points of direction. So they talk about the different sizes of platoons and different sizes of divisions, and of course dividing to a section, all equals a, a regiment. And then they go on to go kind of go back to talk about points of direction and how the adjutant and the sergeant major, and of course working with the colonel, identify those points of direction. So point Seth continues to go on and actually define points of direction and it says that for points of direction distant objects are chosen which are immovable distinct and suitable to fix exactly the position it's wishing to take the choice of points is determined with one of two following intentions so points s goes on to define what a point of direction is is basically you know an immovable tangible something obvious you know object that that people can uh, you know latch on to visually uh point set specifically says in drill number 766 that for points of direction distant objects are chosen which are immovable distinct and suitable to fix exactly the position which is wishing to take so for the colonel identifying the point of direction or the sergeant major and the adjutant helping out point those points of direction, again, what you're looking for is not nothing hard, something hopefully pretty easy that we're going to those tops of trees, we're going to that hill over there, we're going to that point in the rock. Uh, you know, anything that is distinct, uh, obvious to where everyone can identify, that's where we are heading. Points of direction and guides are critical I mean, the, the points at school, the regiment goes on for pages. I mean, we're talking right now for pages identifying how important guides are on how important points of direction are. So finally, the last thing that I found interesting in the school, the regiment is that it's very clear to state the following points that says that the regiment draws the saber and returns the saber or even presents the saber only at the command of the colonel. And of course, which this order is not repeated. So I gotta find that interesting that rarely does it say that uh, certain orders are only given by the, by the colonel, uh, but specifically for drawing saber uh, or returning saber or presenting saber, uh, that order is only given by the colonel and the order is not repeated. Kind of interesting.
So I actually tested this statement uh, by Poinsett saying this and did a, a text search in Poinsett for the word draw. And every time the word draw, whether it's saber or anything else in the school of the regiment, uh, that draw is specifically given by the colonel and nowhere else. Uh, so therefore, I guess they're true, uh, whole, you know, true to the word that uh, you know the, the word draw, the order of draw, saber is only given by the colonel, uh, which is interesting to note. So keep that in mind next time on the field. Whew, wow. Uh, that, now, that may be a little bit confusing. That is basically what uh, point sets covers and all the different nuances and facets in the introduction to the school of the regiment. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because the reason, reason I wanted to cover it is because in trying to school our abilities and improve our skills and get into the manuals and dive in the manuals, I always want to encourage you guys to get in the manuals. Uh, but if you ever open point sets, or even cooks for that matter, or for you Indian Wars, guys, Uptons for that matter, when you, if you just open up the book and you start reading it midway through, uh, you actually get confused pretty easy, at least I did, and it, it's kind of, you know, proving the point by talking about the school of the regiment, how if you don't understand the, the school of the trooper dismounted, or the school of the uh, platoon, or the school of the squadron, there is no way you're going to be able to understand the, the specifics and what point sets is asking you to do when you're going through, through the maneuvers and the drills associated with the school of the regiment. Uh, this may, again, it can be a little bit confusing if you have not spent a lot of time in point sets. Some muscle memory and some of that mind and the hearing those words may be uh, confusing as well. And my simple goal in this video is to introduce exactly how point sets itself introduces the school of the regiment. Uh, what we have discussed is the introduction in the third volume volume of point sets. And as we continue to talk about this, I'm excited to continue our journey through the main cavalry tactics manual used during the war and see on an individual trooper's level exactly how cavalry was deployed in the field. Thanks for watching. Please like us on Facebook, subscribe to our channel, click the bell below to receive notifications when we post things. Uh, and until we see you in the field, dive in the manual, read the manual, become a better trooper, and of course, ride hard.